All right, let's get into this word. Y'all ready? Father, we thank you for the holy written word. We thank you for your power, Lord. Teach us, lead us, guide us. Jesus' name, amen. The title of this message is called From One Belief to Another. From One Belief to Another. Last week we talked about, uh, the, the title of last week's message is um, The Nocebo Effect. Um, and for a day, and a Sunday, I was Dr. J. Someone uh, disrespected me by calling me Dr. Fauci. And I, and I was thoroughly upset on the inside. Well, I, I am Dr. J. I was Dr. J last week. I will be before you, Pastor Jasper, today. If you haven't checked out that message, you need to go check it out. It's powerful. Some of the things we talked about were uh, we went through our own clinical trial. And in in any clinical trial, uh, many times um, the doctor who are testing um, new medications and new uh, prescribed medications to see how they are affected in the body, many times they judge it up against the placebo effect. The placebo effect is none other than a sugar pill, but because of doctors said it can help you and it'll change you, the, the person who receives that actually receives change in their body despite medi no medicinal purposes, no medication in the pill, none at all. Just the fact that they believe that changes the chemistry in a person's body. The opposite side of the placebo effect, placebo effect is a positive outcome of taking this experiential drug, amen? And so the nocebo effect is the very opposite. The doctor says this, this medication can help you. And then he said also there are side effects. Um, most of us, there are more examples and, and we are um, more driven to um, participate in and operate in the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect is the ability to believe in this drug and its side effects. So you have people who take a placebo, which is a sugar pill, and start experience the negative side effects of that drug in this clinical trial without any medication. All right. So the emphasis of bringing that, that message out is to show you the ability to believe, the power that human beings have if we believe. And that if you can believe a doctor and the chemistry of your body will change based off of what he said and what he's promised and what he said it can do for you, how much more can you believe in Jesus and his promises and what he said and how he said he, we can do it? Amen. Amen. What is the outcome? of your life when we believe. Jesus said nothing is impossible if we believe. Of course, there are the human body and the human was made to believe in Jesus and doctors and, and people are very limited on how much results they're going to get by taking a medication and believing a doctor. Amen. They're going to be very limited because there, there go some things that a doctor just won't be able to do. And when the answers run out and they don't have a solution for your problem, we still have someone that we can depend and rely on and trust in. Amen. And I believe that we was created to believe in Jesus. Amen. And the enemy has hijacked our ability to believe. And he's, do, he's done it in many different ways, especially in 2020. Amen. So just imagine on the flip side, if that can happen in a clinical trial, what can happen while you watching the news? What can happen while you looking at your timeline? How much can your chemistry of your body change when you hear that information? From somebody you respect and love, from a preacher, from a doctor, preacher, so and so. A man who has influence, has the ability to move the people, especially if he has not been grounded in truth. He still has the ability to move you, especially when you trust him. And that's me. That's Jake's. That's anybody that you look to. They have the ability to move you when you begin to trust. So this is why it's dangerous. And this is why we must take heed to our to our ability, because it can bring us significant damage. It can bring us significant 
health depend on how you believe and what you believe in. Amen. And so through, during 2020, we've seen a lot. We heard a lot. And I am not surprised if the placebo effect was in full effect and still is. Amen. That's why you have to be careful what you accept as truth. Let's get in this word from one belief to another. Romans chapter four, verse 17 to 24. New King James Version says, as it, it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believe. We break that down. So that he became the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now, it was not for his sake alone that it was imputed, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Nocebo versus placebo. It's the placebo is the ability to believe in the positive outcome. Nocebo is the ability to believe in the negative outcome. This message today is about how your belief system need to be discipled. This message today is about your belief system has a need to be discipled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hopefully by the end of this message, I will answer these questions. What is the purpose of your belief system? What does it mean to believe in God? How to change how and what you Believe to believe the definition of believe, as I look this up, means to ex my definition means to accept. But as I looked it in the word, the Bible talks about how it means to be convinced, to be fully persuaded. Let's say repeat after me to accept, to be convinced, to be fully persuaded. All right. Let's say it again to accept, to be convinced. To be fully persuaded. All right, let's get into this word. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 19. James chapter 2, verse 19. The devils believe. You believe that there is one God and you will do well. Even the devils believe and tremble. What is the difference between how you believe and the devil believe? If the devil believes, is there a, and he is not saved, he is not going to heaven, he don't want to go to heaven, but they believe, right, and tremble. Now, what is the difference between how you believe in God and how the devil believes? Ask yourself that question. Amen? Because there is a big difference. The big difference. So when you hear the word believe, we go to accept, we go to convince, we go to fully persuade it. So the enemy want to keep us in this balance of being between beliefs. There is a conversion process when we get saved where what we once believed in and how we believe has to be discipled over into God. Amen. The thing that you used to get your love from in the world can't be the thing that can't be the way that you get that you feel your love tank in Jesus. Right. The way you used to get it before and how you used to believe how you had to do it has to be discipled. And that belief has to be discipled over into how you need to get it in God. Has there been a conversion process in how you believe? Amen. When did it happen? How did it happen? When Jesus 
after three and a half years being with the disciples at the end of his road, knowing that he was going to get up out of here, he, he approached the disciples and he said, do you finally believe? They was with him the whole time and Jesus had the nerve to say, you just now believe it? That means you can be saved a number of years, going to church a number of years and, and never really approach the beginning of how Jesus wants you to believe. Not how you choose to believe, not how your grandmama told you to believe, not how your denomination said you should do it like this. No, how Jesus said you should do it. You should never have no beliefs that you came up with your own. But I just believe that Jesus didn't teach you. Jesus has his way of doing things. He is the way. And have you lined your belief up with the way he said we should believe? Have you accepted what Jesus wants you to accept? Are you convinced about what Jesus wants you to be convinced about? Are you fully persuaded about what he desires for your life? Amen. Amen. John chapter 7, verse 38 says, He who believes me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. There is a way that the scriptures points to us to believe. We know we shall flow as many as the emphasis of this verse many times when it's being um, when it's when it's being recited. But what I want to bring into this uh, message is there is a way that the scriptures is pointing to us, pointing us to believe. There is a way that God wants us and desire for us to believe. Amen. And many times we choose our own way. We adopt our own philosophies and it's not the way that God wants to teach us. And so I've learned to just commit my belief to the Lord and say, Lord, teach me. Because when you go to the scriptures and you put yourself in a disciple's place, you uh, you and you put yourself in the disciple's place in the scriptures. If you really if you ain't put yourself in the disciple's place in the scriptures, you're really not believing the way the scriptures have said. If there isn't a flow of river of life coming out of your mouth, you might want to check how you believe. Not just I'm just not like. You might want to check how you believe. I'm just not like that. No, you might want to check how you believe. If life is in, coming out of your mouth flowing, you might want to check. You don't have to be up here in front of the uh, uh, in front of in front of people like me. But you, there there is a pattern that you should see uh, in the scriptures that you also should look at your life and see a semblance of what Jesus said you can operate in. Amen. The Bible talks about how there is a place that we should believe. In Romans 10, 10 says, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Where do you believe? The Bible says in your heart. How do you, how do we know what we believe? In our heart. Well, the Bible says out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. What you talk about, how you believe really comes out of you. All of your actions, all of your reactions. That's really how you believe. Many times I've repented many times because of my reaction to a, a given scenario. I can't say, you know, I ain't mean to. Oh, I can't say it like Kadaj is saying, I, you know, I ain't try to do that. No, if it came out of your actions, there's something in your heart. That you need to adjust, not behavior modifications. No, I'll, not, I'll try real hard next time. No, you need to get on. We, we, I, this is the way I do it. I get on my knees and I say, Lord, teach me how to believe in this area. I keep cussing them out. I keep getting mad. I keep getting frustrated. Lord, teach me how to believe in this area. Lord, show me how to do what my mother say, my father say. Teach me how to submit to the pastor, Lord God. Lord, show me how to submit to you. Teach me your ways, God. Show me how to believe, God, because my actions and my behavior is displaying something else. Amen. You always go what you your belief leads to trust. Your trust will you. You believe that this is the way you're supposed to be. Amen. Psalms chapter 
Psalms Division 27, verses 12 through 14, the NIV translation. David said, I would have fainted if I didn't believe to see the promises of the Lord in the land of the living. Your believing affect how you see. How you believe affect your perspective. Your perspective te- communicates to you any given scenario. There is something that we should be expecting in God when we believe. All right. Many people approach God. And, and I was talking about how last week we believe we believe professionals, people who have professions before. And I we supposed to. Right. They have the skills. They have the knowledge. They have the expertise. Um, but in Christ, we tend to nocebo God. I call it noceboing. You read the scriptures, and instead of believing the possibilities, we go to noceboing, which is believing the negative effects that could happen. Then we don't even make an attempt to even do it. Why? Because we know see both the scriptures. We think about the negative side effects or what what if it don't happen? Well, we know it ain't going to happen if you don't step out. You can almost guarantee it ain't going to happen if you never step out. So why? Why does your mind go to no see boy? Because it's a possibility. And we know see both the scriptures all the time. Jesus said, greater works than these is usually, yeah, but uh, you got to, uh, no, see, Bo. Uh, God said he can supply all you. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but you, you just can't. You got to just. We have a reason and we have an excuse to not expect what the script, what the scriptures tell us to expect. Why do we see ourselves failing at making attempts to do what God told us to do? We we know see both God all day long. We thinking about how we're going to fail at this, how this ain't going to work, how that we ain't going to make it, how you ain't enough, how you ain't going to never be enough. You ain't going to never. Pro- all day long. No see both is more common with God. Even with the doctors. Why is that? There is an agenda by the enemy to get you to believe a certain way. Amen. Get you to believe a certain way, to accept the reality that God never accept, never intended for you to have. And when we would believe that, we create the environment. For if you never step out and pray for somebody to be healed, we can almost guarantee they might not get healed from you praying. If you never step out and tell them how the goodness of the Lord in the land of living, how the Lord healed you and he set you free. Praise God. Amen. And I believe that we have to believe enough where, where the Lord to do something for us where we got something to tell somebody. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Really, really, you can't tell nobody how good that steak was until you taste it, right? The reason you probably ain't telling nobody because you might not have tasted yet. And we need to really get on our knees and say, Lord Jesus, Lord God, I want to taste you. I want to experience you. I want to know you. What is this that pastor talking about all the time? What is this power? And, and they, they, they operate in power. What, why is he not, not scared to approach somebody and tell them that Jesus will heal them? Lord, teach me that, Lord. Not so I be the only one to tell these neighbors. They, these neighbors ain't the only one I should. They shouldn't know me only. When you going to go out here and tell somebody, hey, my name is. Right? It ain't hard. <laughs> we just go and meet people. Let them know that we done tasted something. We experienced something and it was good. That is not hard. It's not hard to tell somebody about that good movie, is it? It's not hard. 
I don't believe that. Well, you didn't experience it. You didn't experience the movie I watched. You didn't taste the steak. I taste it. Many times we have a testimony that God just bubbling on the inside of us and he done done for us. And that testimony is not just for you to sit on. He wants you to tell it. He wants you to give. Amen. He wants you to give that testimony without reservation. Stop being ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ and open up your mouth. Tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord. Amen. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about a system. I'm talking about experiencing a person. He came down and he's done something. He just didn't tell us how much he loved us. He showed us. He displayed it. Then he gave us his spirit and said, ah, there go the feelings of it. There go the feelings of how much I love you. And when you reject the Holy Spirit, you reject the experience of feeling the anointing and the power of God. They want to affect yourself. He want to affect you to the point where it changes you. You'll never forget. It marks something in your timeline where you're like, man, praise God. This was, a, this, this was a pivotal moment in my life that I'll never forget. And I always got to I always got to remind myself and tell somebody, man, Jesus saved me over 18 years ago. And I'll never forget how his spirit came on the inside of me and how I was depressed. And I was how I looked at, I looked at myself down in myself. And he came on the inside of me and I felt a joy and a love that I never felt before. Somebody need to know because they don't they haven't tasted Somebody need to experience what you have experienced. Somebody need, need your testimony. I needed that testimony today. Amen. Amen. I needed to hear how Alethea ain't in pain. I love that stuff. Why? That reflects how good my God is. That, may, that helps me to believe I'm not just coming here for nothing. That helps me realize that God's power is flowing through this place. If you only believe you can sit back and get the crumbs of the gospel yourself or you can sit at the table and eat good if you want to. It's according to your faith. It's according to how you believe. Amen. Amen. Jesus wants you to see. He wants you to believe to see the results of how he has told us to believe. You don't have to continue in what you've been experiencing up until this point. There's more that God wants you to know of him. Amen. What are you expecting? What are you expecting from God? He he is teaching us to walk by faith and not by sight. We always should should expect what his word says we should expect. If he said they're not going to like you because of me, you might as well expect that. It ain't no sea boy to think that folks ain't going to like you. He put the no sea boy in the scripture and said they ain't going to like you, Jasper. <laughs> Amen. Everybody not going to hooray you. and Good job, Jasper. Good job until you come to the house. It's almost a guarantee. If you, if you decided, you know, you in your house, you, you decided to believe by yourself, you can almost guarantee there is an assignment from the enemy to keep you from experiencing that. And he has sent a person. He has sent a news report. He has sent something in your timeline on your DM to interrupt you from ever finding out. That prayer you prayed. And you have, to, you have to be tactful and know his devices. He'll send a family member. He'll send a daughter. He'll send a son. And I love my family. I love my kids. I don't love them that much, though. Amen? I'm going to take away my faith in my Lord Jesus Christ. No, sir. You can go out there and serve the devil all you want to. I'm not serving him. I'm staying in there with Jesus. I already know how that, that, I already know how that story is. I already walked that mountain too many times. Expected, you know what? You know, no, I already know. If you don't want to take my advice for it, go out there and find it yourself and bust your head. I don't want you to bust your head. But I pray you do real quick before you waste 15, 20 years. Because you're going to look up in 20 years and be gone. (laughs) 
Amen. Amen. So we walk by faith and not by sight. This is this is a just a foundation faith teaching. We're going from one belief to another. Jesus, when he speaks, he wants you to put hope in what he said. He wants you to believe, accept, be convinced, be persuaded that what he's saying is true. From there, you can't believe, you can't have two masters. One going to tell you to go left and one going to tell you to go right. You're going to have to decide. There has to decide. No, I choose Jesus. And we do this all the time with our words. But the Bible says that we don't believe with our words. We believe with our heart. We don't believe with our head. We believe with our heart. When we believe in our heart, we are aware that there is another way that the enemy wants us to believe and to accept. And we have to be all conscious of that it's another option coming to me to get me off this path that Jesus wants me to have. Amen. You have to prepare for the option. The enemy is not just going to let you get away and say, you know what? Okay, keep praying that prayer in your room by yourself. As long as you keep choosing my option, you can believe all you want to. And the church has made that believing. They can act like they want, do what they want. And we want to know, we want, we, and, and then somebody like me can be ridiculed, Jeff. You just, you just think you're perfect. You just want to be, you know, I'm talking about this holiness all the time, man. I can't be holy without him. I can't be holy without listening to him. Yeah, I make mistakes, but I'm getting it right and get back in there with the Lord. I'm following the Lord. You ain't going to find me down there doing, doing all that stuff that I used to do, do. Amen. Why? Because he's too good. I done taste it. It don't taste the same when you go back to it. <laughs> well, you done tasted that steak and you done tasted that steak and the filet mignon like really supposed to be cooked, too. And then you got to make sure the right cook yeah. is cooking. Yeah. Amen. Why would you go back to bologna? <laughs> I love, I, you know, I wasn't below me. Yeah, okay. It's kind of, you know, remind me where I came from. Amen. We just let it sit in there and rot. This is, praise God, I came a long way. Praise. I just buy a pack of bologna, just sit in there, just let it rot, right? And never eat it, just to keep in remembrance that Jesus brought me and get that steak out the freezer. <laughs> Why go back? To the vomit. Once you realize it's vomit, why go back to that? Ain't nothing good in that. Amen. I advise you to get another experience from God. Taste again. You need to come back to the table. Yes, God. Come back to the table. Go from one belief to another, not back to. Amen. Amen. It's your choice. It ain't even, why God don't blame the devil? I asked that question last sermon. Why God doesn't blame the devil for the outcome of this world? Because he placed the power in mankind to choose. He placed the power in mankind to accept truth or reject it. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 um, says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Um, the New Living Translation says, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Why is seeing such a hindrance to how we believe? Why is what we see is a hindrance to what we believe? Sometimes what we see is we're used to calculating. We're used to um, being logical and analytical and do what makes sense, even though some people don't even display that, but we do what makes sense to us. We're analytical. So, um, and at times, God needs our analytical mind, Amen. But when he's telling us to do something that do doesn't make sense, this is when our analytical mind can get in the way. Because our analytical mind go about what is to handle what's present, 
to, it, it handles the physical real. It handles it. Amen? That's what it's anointed to do, to handle the physical realm. All right? But it can be a hindrance when Jesus is pointing us to do something that doesn't, doesn't make sense. You don't see the outcome. How is it by saying, Lord, heal me? How is that going to heal me? You understand? But by reaching in prayer, why? Because he said it. And people who only in their analytical mind doesn't even see and they only they say uh, believing is seeing or seeing is believing. That is the world's philosophy. It is believing. But in Christ, believing is seeing. Amen. So that is a dynamic that actually that and it's a, a universal saying that has been accepted. And we say it all the time. Seeing is believing. And that can hinder your faith. How? Well, let's go through the scriptures. The Bible says we walk by believing. We live by believing and not by seeing. Amen. This physical realm and how we feel can convince us and preach a message to us that's contrary to what Jesus is teaching us to believe. How does how does it make sense to lay hands on somebody who's sick and they're going to recover? If you're analytical, you're never it, it, you won't put faith in Jesus words that says this. He said for those who believe, he said this is this is only for those who believe. Boy, this is going to be some good stuff. Mark chapter 16, verse 7, uh, verse 6. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. Let this bring healing to you. And let this affect your believing. He said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Are you preaching the gospel? Do you see yourself in the scriptures? Is he talking to just the disciples or is he talking to you as well? Are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, it's a very common thing that disciples preach the gospel into all the world. And he says to every creature, he who believes and is baptized is saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow. He already told you if you don't believe, these signs will not follow. He said you, you'll be condemned. That means you would, this, to the unbeliever, this really for everyone. Who believes? But those who don't believe will definitely will not see these. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. A disciple cast out demons. You in your house, you in your house, you wake up in, in a, you, you know, you in your house by yourself, you get that eerie feeling, cast out that feeling. Your feeling is an indicator that something is going on. You can't see it. But everybody and their mama know when they go to sleep, there is more to life than this physical realm. When you dream and go to sleep and it, you, you know there's more than what you're feeling and what you're sensing in this physical realm. Amen. People don't want to they don't want to talk about it because they, they will have to study it. They have to give credit to it. And when I use Jesus name to tell the fear to leave my house, cast out devils. Right. When I hear that mind, when that, that stuff come to my mind, that no see boy come to my mind that you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to you're going to die early. And all these things are alive from the pits of hell. That is a message straight from Satan. And you need to rebuke him with Jesus words. He said, I shall live and not die. Jesus came that I may have life and have it more abundantly. So that's what I believe. And then I say, I shall live and not die. Get out this house in Jesus name. I don't. I don't, well, I don't know if that really is. No, that is a message sent from Satan. It's in contrary to what Jesus promised me, and so I treat it as such. It's a demon that's sent to get you to doubt what God has promised. They will speak in new tongues. There's another language that God wants you to have, heavenly language. They will take up serpents, and they will drink any deadly thing, and it will harm them. This will, uh, it will by no means hurt them. There are things that we don't know about. They don't put in food and all kind of stuff ignorantly. We just don't accept it and throwing down our throat, right? But we come into the knowledge of these things, that these things are ne that was never intended for God. God never intended for us to consume, right? And so even if you're ignorant, the Bible talks about how there is grace for you if you believe. 
Amen. All right, let's get into some. Yes, Lord, thank you. My, my, my. Let's go to Romans chapter 4, verse 17 through 24. Romans chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. It's our text, but I'm going to slow up and talk about uh, some things. Let's start at 18. This is about Abraham. Um, it's about uh, how God promised Abraham that he'll be a father of many nations, but he wasn't a father of many nations before God promised it. When God promised it, that's when the expectation rose up in Abraham that he could be or he would be or he was. Right. And so there is. Let's break this on down. He says in 18, who contrary to hope. In hope, believe. Have you ever wondered what that means? To con in contrary to hope. What is contrary to hope? That is, what is it? What, what is naturally accepted? To contrary what? Because hope means expectation. So to in contrary to what is normally expected. Which in the natural realm in hope, believe that second hope is another expectation. What was the, what was the next expectation? It was that he would be the father of many nations, right? So he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be and not being weak in faith. He considered not his own body. Many times there are some things that you would not you would have to not consider in the physical realm to to really, truly accept what God said you can have. The physical realm might speak another message other than what God has spoken to you. He said the Bible says he considered not his body. Why? Because he was old. He was old. And, and Sarah was old. And, and he, the Bible says he didn't even consider. That means by faith, baby, we about to have one. So let's get in here and do some things. Right. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how old I am. It's going to happen. So you do things that doesn't make sense. When you believe. But he gave God gave him another belief to believe in. Because the physical realm gave him an expectation. You too old. But God said, you shall be. So when God said, you shall be, Abraham believed that more than it was, you too old. So what is it about what God's saying about your life that your physical realm is speaking one message, getting you trying to believe in one message, and God said, no, it shall be this way. You have to, you have to contrary to what, Hope is expected. You have to believe in something contrary. And that's why Jesus words getting affiliated with Jesus, getting close to truth so you can accept another reality about your life. Then you'll get another reality about your life. You'll get what he truly intended for you to have. We intended when he when we thought about you before you enter your mother's womb. Amen. He had plans for you before you enter your mother's womb. In your whole life, the enemy has been trying to interject another plan and another um, outcome of your life. To get you to believe that this is just the way it is. No, the original plan that God has for you is the way it is and you need to accept it. Amen. So let's get into this in closing. Come on, Mario. I got a little more. I got a little more. That was quick. <laughs> Lady D, don't worry, I got more. Okay, we not closed. I just want to hear him play. I'm just playing. <laughs> we gonna be shouting here in a little bit, amen. Don't go to sleep. All right. This is so good. How do you diagnose how you believe? Because how you believe matters. Not just I believe, because many people all across the world believe. But how do you believe? This is so good. How do you communicate to yourself? What is it that you talk about on the inside of you back to yourself? It's similar to, you know, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to the grocery store today. I'm going to go to the meeting today. Then after that, I'm going to do this. Then after that, I'm going to do that. There is a voice. And it's yours. 
It's your inner voice. How are you communicating back to yourself? Then that voice could transition over into your life. Start ministering to you some ideas that you need to expect or some ideas trying to get you to expect a certain reality for the day or for your life or what is the message that you tell yourself about your finances? What is the message that you tell yourself about your healing, about your marriage, about your kids, about yourself? The enemy wants to convince you through this still small voice. How do you minister to yourself? This is so good. They don't love me. Come on. Let's get real. She don't love me. Right after that statement, everything you do, everything you've ever done for them, comes up. That same little voice that told you to get up, we're going to go to this today and do that today says, see? If they love you, then how you believe need to be discipled. That voice on the inside of you ministering to you need to be discipled. Need to be discipled by our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I'm, you're not successful until you do this. You know, you're not successful until you do that. Then images. Say, Lord, help my unbelief. Is that voice, does that voice remind you of Jesus? Or has that voice been shaped and molded by how people have treated you your whole life? How you have failed? All your shortcomings. All your regret. So good. Is that voice trying to convince you of a reality that's the opposite of what God has promised? So what has to happen on the inside of us to reverse these effects? Many times we don't recognize how we minister to ourselves. We don't recognize it. You put more hope in your neighbors than you do your own self. You minister more of hope of Jesus Christ to, your, to people you see more than you do your own self. And the Bible talks about how we should encourage ourselves. Does that voice do that? Do you just get thrilled? Hey man, hey, hey man, I'm awesome. You know, I'm just awesome. Because when, when that voice has been converted to speak the language of heaven, you walk around like you're famous. Not with arrogance or pride, but but 
this is the confidence I have in him. Amen. What you smiling about? I'm a son. I'm a son. But you just messed up yesterday. I'm a son. Jesus is teaching me. He is showing me. And your posture and how you see yourself will let the world know. Will let the world know what you truly believe. Because until you start ministering to yourself what Jesus says, do you really believe that? God loves you. Well, do that voice tell you God loves you? You're going to make it. Well, do that voice on the inside of you tell you you're going to make it? Woo, you got to line up. And these inner vows, they need to be broken. There is a, there, when we think about a subject, there is a message. When you think about any given subject, there is a message. We think about any given subject, there's words, there's images, there's an experience or the lack of one or the curiosity of one. Has that been shaped by Jesus and his words and his spirit? Because some of us, we can be confident over here in one area, just totally bold and confident. And like a little child over here in another. We could be so zealous and know that I go out in the streets and tell people about Jesus and his love for me. And my wife say one thing at home and I cripple up like a little. What is it? And, and, and I realized Jesus had to disciple me out of it. Because as long as I blamed her, she was... I, when I blame anybody else but me first, like, it almost gave it reason to stay like that. And it really does. You're empowering that area to stay when you're always pointing the finger at somebody else. And I believe, I believe that some things aren't your fault, but you can control how you respond. You shouldn't have an excuse why you don't look like Jesus. I don't care who said it. I don't care what they done did. did. Why? Because no one... No one is that important but Jesus. Amen. So what is it? How is it that you minister to yourself? That's where we need to start. This is so good. This revelation. Jesus told me this revelation. Because Jesus say, go talk to them and you talk yourself right out of. But what? But what? Jesus will tell you to go step out and do that, but this, but that. Jesus will tell you to go do this, go do that, but this, but that. I don't know. I... And the voice convinces you. Amen. The voice that you obey is what you believe. There are many things that convinces us to move and move us. But what I found is most detriment to human beings and to people and to you. Is how do you minister to yourself? How many of y'all recognize what I'm saying to be true? And so. Let's bring Jesus into this realm, into our consciousness, into uh, this inward communication that, that transpires um, and creates scenarios and creates perspectives and, and give you interpretations about people and minister to us all the time, guys. All the time. And there is a constant recalibrating that has to occur once you understand truth. There is a constant realignment to truth. Realignment to truth. 
when pilots are traveling these big planes from one destination to another, they set in their coordinates of where they are and their coordinates to where they're going. And I'm told that 99% of the time, they are, of course, the plane is constantly readjusting to the winds, to the opposition, constantly. But it couldn't do it if it didn't have a destination. It's constantly readjusting to. And this is what happens in our faith. And how we believe. But we have to be calibrated to truth. That's why it has to be a transformation of the mind. It has to be an invading of what Jesus wants to you. His desires, how he sees you, how much he loves you, how much he loves others. And we constantly making adjustments because all of life been trying to con convince you of the opposite of what Jesus has said about you and it's trying to get you I'm trying to get you from one belief to another from what life been telling you and what your mom and all your family and everybody know about you to what Jesus said because it's not about what they call you and how they see you is do you see and have you accepted and do you answer to what they call you? Do you recognize and accept it? This is okay, this is just who I am. No, it's more. If Jesus calls you a businessman, Destin. You're a businessman. If he calls you a businessman, Fred, you're a businessman. And let me help all y'all believers. If he calls you a soul winner, but I don't, I don't, kill it. I, 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 kill it. You're a soul winner. If you are a new creature in Christ, but, 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 kill it. I'm a new creature. Amen? All things passed away. And all things have become new. I am a soul winner. What does God promise to you? I am rich. I don't lack in nothing. What has God called you? I am loved and complete. I thank God. Woo! Woo! Yes, God. Hallelujah, God. See, that's me. What is God saying about you?